How are you? Okay, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you feeling? A lot better. You um, had gallbladder surgery, huh? I had gallbladder surgery and I've got pancreatitis, which is the killer. It, mm. The pain is unbelievable. They've given me morphine for it. But the problem is it floors me. Mm. I really I hate that feeling. I, I have to be careful with what I eat and I'm waiting up for my next surgery. I'm aware of my limitations <laughs> at the moment, so I have to work accordingly. I really like to be 100% because you've taken the time to come on. So thank you so much for your patience and oh, your gosh. understanding. I really appreciate it. No, gosh, that's expected of anyone in this realm. And I felt so sad to hear what was happening because I didn't know. So I'm grateful that you're better and you look great. You're emanating a lot of good energy. So that's great. And I can appreciate that. Nobody wants to be somewhere and not give their whole heart, especially something like this. A lot has to do with faith, meditation and prayer, what I call prayer energy where you're able to channel the power of the universe rather than having one foot in heaven and one foot in hell mm -hmm. and then trying to get, negotiate both. It, since my NDE experience in January 2022. Mm, um, well, recent, yeah. Yeah, so it's quite recent. I think that changed me, not in terms of a drastic change, but it gave me a peek behind the veil in terms of my time and energy here and what I'm mm. doing here each day is a gift we're mm. given. Many of us waste precious time and don't really look at what is our mission here? What are we mm. here to do? And, and maybe it's not for everybody, but from my standpoint, it's about how do we facilitate the upgrade and elevation of the human race? Your points are really great points, especially with the fact that having such a powerful experience is what you had brought you to this revelation. For the ones that haven't had those experiences, not needing to have that big grandiose moment, but to encourage others to say, hey, you don't have to have that crisis or that spiritual awakening moment. You can have it just by shifting your perspective of knowing that this is such a beautiful place where we are. We're so blessed. It can be difficult to shift your mind, but when you really see, like you said, the beauty of why we are here and the blessings of being here, it's really powerful. I agree. I'm not advocating everybody goes into emergency surgery and has that experience, but it's that shift in perspective where mm -hmm. can we provide the love, the feeling and the sensing of creation as right. being part of the co-creation and play our participant part on the stage of right. this theater we call earth can we play our part and i think that comes more and more into understanding who and what you're becoming and the essence of you not the personality but what is the essence of you what are you here to do if you've got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell i know that can be interpreted in various ways depending on the mm. context but there's a, a metaphorical interpretation there's this dual role dual existence where you it could refer to someone managing multiple roles or responsibilities like balancing right. work and and family yeah and family but i see it struggling both worlds where we're mm. navigating between the cultural social and ideological environments and a cosmological universal and creational environment there are multiple mm. dimensions where mm. we can exist simultaneously in more than one dimension. We're, we're meant right. to be grounded here. It's not mm. about getting out of the body. It's getting into the right. body. It's so true. You open up so many questions with that, right? So how do you stay here in the moment, in your body, grounded on earth, on mother earth, this beautiful place that we're so blessed to be and have all the knowledge of above, but to have the marriage of it in this moment in time and to know all of that and to utilize it here because mm. it is a finite time here because we have time and time is part of the earth realm, whereas everywhere else it's not. That is the goal, the hope, the experience of daily existence here on this realm. That's what we hope to do. It's reminding yourself to come back down into your body but holding all that powerful 
energy. I will admit I'm still a student. I'm always going to be a student. I'm struggling with it. Not struggling, but it, it comes up for me on a daily existence, reminding myself, be present in this moment. This is all we have. So when I'm being called for work and then the laundry's piled up in the back and then dinner's on the stove and my children are coming and I have work and I have to really remind myself to calm and still and be here because at the end of the day, when I cross over, I'm not going to look back and be like, dang, you left all that laundry in the laundry <laughs> room <laughs> sitting there for days because that's not what's important. It's about that beautiful young face that's asking me a question so mm -hmm. I can really register. And that's where I am I'm on my path is to reminding myself to be like for now with you being here in this moment. Mm -hmm. That's really not worrying about that moment that just passed or what's to come for the day. It's just this moment. That's the reminder we all need in a very nice and gentle and loving way. It is that slowing down process and reminder that the body is always in the present. It's not in the right. past. It's not in the future. It's only your mind that goes mm -hmm. that way, that goes into the past, mm -hmm. which is usually focused on shame and guilt or the future is mm. the what if the anxiety and the fear and it, it, and this is what i mean we can have one foot in heaven and one foot in hell but we need to come into the present understand that whilst you have all those maintenance aspects of life mm -hmm. because 99 percent of life is maintenance you got to get up in the morning you got to <laughs> go to the toilet you've got to wash and brush <laughs> your teeth you got to do the laundry get the kids and most of life is maintenance but can we push back the space to right. play our participant part within that maintenance realm right. but it'll reserve one percent for co-creation, reverence, meditation, mm. all those practices. Because what I note, especially in the spiritual community, and I'm not tarnishing everybody with the same brush, but many can give you a good spiritual talk. And I've mm. listened to hundreds of people, but are they living it? Are they living right. spiritually day by day when the S-H-I-T hits the fan. Are you standing in front of it with your mouth open? Are you aware? <laughs> Hope, not. Hope not, exactly. <laughs> so it's in those times of, do you have the resources to be able to live a spiritual life, which is not navel gazing in my view. It's the practical application. Mm -hmm. Can we humanize that into application on a daily basis? And I think the goal is to be as calm and present as possible so that whatever comes to you, the good moments, the bad moments, you are able to receive them fully yes. and presently so that then you don't fall over. If I may share something, I've had a lot of loss in my life in the last three years and just had lost a family member just recently this past week. And they've all been very special to me. Each time someone passes, I've gotten better acclimated to handling it in the sense that it would wipe me out. And I would be, of course, losing a parent and an aunt and an uncle. It's a very big, powerful thing, especially when they're big influences of who I am. But I have gotten better at receiving the information, then getting a message from them, reminding me that they are okay, that this is a part of the journey yeah, and that they are home the vision they give me and then the feeling that I get within really helps me not fall over and be a bubbling mess. Of course, I do shed my tears and I honor the feelings that I have, but it's helped me to be more present to say, okay, well, this is the gift why I'm here still. All of that to say is the hope is to be here and experience all that we are experiencing mm. because that's why we're on earth. When my mother passed in the hospice, I found mm. that was an opportunity. Besides the grief, there was grief, there was anger. Sure. I went through all of that stuff and it really did hit the fan. And I was standing in front of it. I was a mess and I was like a half set jelly wobbling all over the place. But the flip side was I recognized it. But it also mm -hmm. allowed me to say, this is the journey. This is a principle of conservation and spiritual mm -hmm. leadership. Because can I be here as an agency mm -hmm. that 
ensures the efficient recycling and maintenance of the universe's underlying material and its mm. energetic mm. resources as it and we evolve. Because there's a force that perpetually births new forms, mm -hmm. new patterns, mm -hmm. new motives that can transcend and subsume what came before. Okay, my mum passed and there was a sadness and all the rest of it. But there was an overarching principle for me, which was the organic trajectory of her life and each one of our lives. It's the grand sequence of life's unfolding from the most simplest things, the most profound things, to the fact that we are sentient, self-reflective beings capable right. of influencing and even co-creating the universe's course along the way. This is the organic stream that right. humankind represents at this pivotal stage in whatever circumstance is presented to us. We're a species that are entrusted with the tremendous responsibility mm -hmm. of shepherding life's currents towards our ultimate transcendence. We are, we are the penultimate filter through which that divine creative plan flows and expresses itself at this mm. phase of this cosmological unveiling. Wow. You should put that on a napkin. That's big. That's so powerful and beautiful. And it's so true. We are that filter. And to then live and to take all that amazing knowledge and understanding and unconditional love and to live it daily. This is a profound freedom. This is mm. the liberty that we are afforded of open-ended becoming. Just like our universe open endlessly moves into a future of infinite possibility, so too we can contain within us the right. sovereign capacity of choice and self-directed participation mm -hmm. in shaping our agency, shaping our personal and collective destinies. But we have mm -hmm. to be able to let freedom wash over us rather than just going on this grand, I'm just going to choose my own adventure story. Right, yeah. We, we, we need to look at humanity's rich heritage as well as its turbulent history. The revelation for me is that while we've been imbued with staggering responsibility, we've also sown the seeds of our potential undoing through pervasive mm. errors and biases mm. and malignant mm -hmm. cultural overlays. Mm. But we have to look at both. It's not just all love and light. No. There is that. Right. But there is, there's a sacred charge that is bestowed upon us. That's my feeling to become mm. conscious co-creators that are aligned with the deepest flows and processes that birth galaxies and life and consciousness. And the mistakes that we have made in the past are there. And you can't change that, right? As you say, to utilize that so we can go forward with the knowledge of what didn't work, where mm. we had our missteps, and then to go forward with that acknowledgement. So yeah, very true. It makes the day not just this benign blinders on. And yes. I think the, the biggest part for many is to have that spiritual awakening moment of, let me take it down. Mm. Let me look around. I just heard about how plants have consciousness. Did you hear about that and how they can sense our emotions our, and they could tell what color shirt we're wearing. And it made me giggle because I have a plant from when I was 20 years old still, and it's over 20 years. I'm not going to tell you my exact age, but it's old enough that it's had many rebirths in almost every place I've ever lived. Mm. And it's come back so strong. When I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, it's incredible. There's so much beauty and power and love and in life everywhere you turn. If you can live like that, and it's a big ask because then you're really steeped in it. But if you can, oh my gosh, every single breath you take is this incredible gift. It's when I get in those moments of living, there are no words that can describe it. That's why I 
remind myself. Sometimes I literally do pinch myself to say, hey, lady, wake up because <laughs> be here because it's hard sometimes with, mm. again, all the periphery, all that stuff. When you walk past evergreen trees, they release terrapins and mm. those terrapins lower cortisol and mm. inflammation. So nature has its own remedial balm like plants do. But anyway, what were we talking about? A lot. <laughs> We were talking about, I can't remember now, these things come in and they go. That's okay. But it's been really, it's amazing. And we just went right into it. It's funny. We didn't even go for the beginning. So I, I like that. Sometimes it's good to have an organic dialogue. Let's talk about your journey. Let's talk about healing and discovery. I think that's a fascinating world. I know that you're a remarkable lady. I can feel that from the essence of you. <laughs> you're a remarkable spiritual teacher. I know you're an Akashic Records mm -hmm. consultant and energy, and mm -hmm. you've got what, over, is it, over 20 years of experience as a physical therapist, and you had a profound spiritual awakening. Is that right? My first experience of knowing there was a big lesson to learn was when I was in preschool. But the cognitive awareness of it, my brain understanding what this message was, didn't come until later. But I'm really grateful for all the lessons and the hardships and the struggles that I went through as a younger person to bring me to this moment because even though they were hard and I had turmoil and teenage angst and youthful existence of not being what society wanted at that moment or whatever it was, I can look back and say, I'm so grateful for that. I am so blessed, ironically. Some people might say, what? But I really feel so happy about it because I can sit here and talk about what I went through and, and how I had to contend and heal. And you were mentioning the energy healing and the Akashic Records, they're powerful and can really help you heal those deep wounds from childhood, from past lives, concurrent lives. It's truly very powerful mm -hmm. and exciting. How did that particular experience or those series of experiences shape your agency and your future path and ultimately lead you to transition from the traditional physical therapy, mm -hmm. I, it's what I understand you were doing mm -hmm. at one point, to more of an integrated, holistic healing, if that's the right term. I think it always was within me to want to be this healer, a person, but I really didn't have a grasp of it. I knew in the back of my mind that was where I was meant to go. And all my life, my parents, my father was a physician, my mother is a physician. We have aunts and uncles and grandparents that were physicians. My in-laws are in the medical field. My husband's a physician. My twin brother's a physician. My sister's a nurse practitioner. Medicine was all around me, so I wanted to be a doctor. At the time of going to college, I said, okay, maybe I won't become a doctor, but I'll go into PT. In my program, it was holistic based. So there was cranial sacrotherapy offered and a lot of different techniques that were more holistically oriented, which I loved. And then life happened and I needed to get a job and I had to start working, but it always was in the back of my mind. Then it organically came back up again. and. I knew at one point, I actually was supposed to go to medical school and a month before I was leaving, I realized, whoa, but I was able to listen to my inner guidance. I sat down, I listened and I heard, no, that's not your path in this life. So I took back my application. I forgo all the fees that I paid and I really delved into the holistic component of healing. And that's brought me here. You, you have a master's degree in physical therapy and mm -hmm. a whole bunch of certifications in various healing modalities. I see you stand at the intersection mm -hmm. of Western medicine mm -hmm. and Eastern spiritual practices. And I can see that unique position enables and empowers you to offer a much more comprehensive approach to healing that addresses both the physical and the spiritual aspects of well-being. How do you reconcile your Western-based education with the Eastern upbringing and spiritual practices? Can you share an example of how 
this dual perspective has benefited a client in a way that a single approach might not have. You're right. It's that marriage of Eastern and Western Mm. that we all hope to bring forward. And I think the understanding of knowing that there is this bigger power, this divine intervention, this incredible source, the Akasha and the Akashic realm, as well as source energy can be used to help people heal. And you can incorporate that with any physical issues. For myself personally, I had physical pain in my body since I was 14, that when I was in the records and did the energy healing, I was able to clear and release about 90% of it because it was past life wounds and karmas and lessons that I had to learn that I was just holding on that I needed to clear. Sometimes with my clients, they might have something they're struggling with. When I put my hands on them, I can help them that way or energetically, if they're not in person, we can work on it on a bigger and a deeper realm. Sometimes it presents as pain or it presents as something emotionally or mentally, but we can address it that way. Plus also incorporating, listen, if you are having a tight muscle, we got to work on stretching it, or we got to work on the other modalities. Or if they're seeing a physician, yes, you must listen to what your doctors are saying because they are knowledgeable. They have that study, they have that education that's important, but then seeing if we can add to it, utilizing this holistic realm. So again, to always, honor what the other person is saying and respect that, but bringing in the other side so there is that marriage. It can be hard sometimes, and sometimes the universe, the angels, the guides, the Akashic Lords, they might say, you can only do what you can do because what's done is done and you can't change it. And there is a lesson why they needed to have what they needed to have. So you can help them heal and experience it in a less painful or or understand the lesson Because some things people have to go through. That's part of their soul path that they asked to experience. So it's a a fine line, but it's that marriage. That's really where I really try to maintain. That's beautiful. There's profound lessons in that perspective as well. I hear this a lot that people are waking up. There's awakening going on. I'm going, okay, so there's a spiritual awakening. And I know people speak about the current awakening happening on our planet. You can read Mm -hmm. the yogas about the 24,000 year cycle. And I can see that's happening because there are rapidly rising vibrations that are going on Mm -hmm. in the world, but the way they're being interpreted is, is misaligned. And going back to what I was saying earlier, it's easier to, to talk good spiritually. Like I can talk good spiritually, but can I live it? Can I live a spiritual life in a practical manner? So I see spiritual awakening as a challenging process, and it can stir up one's life in very unexpected ways. And I'm speaking Mm -hmm. from experience here, not Mm -hmm. from academia. In -hmm. your experience, guiding others through their spiritual awakening, what are some of the most common challenges that people face, and how do you help them navigate these difficulties while maintaining their growth and their progress? I think the biggest challenge they face is leaving their old life, Mm. leaving the old patterns, knowing they are going to become a different person through this process, this shift, this mind, this perspective change, and having to let go of who they were. And then understanding that there's something really beautiful and wonderful on this side but to know that this was needed, the old self, and to give love to that old self and to say thank you for all those years of protection or whatever it was, but here I am facing this side. Because your life changes. They might physically change, their relationships might change, their jobs might change, their perspectives on who they are changes. So it's really a letting go and opening up to what other possibilities are out there. It's like we were saying before, taking the blinders down. I sometimes get these visions when I'm with clients where they've been living, when you were little, you made dioramas and you have a shoebox and they want you to decorate it. So a lot of the time, the visions are that they're literally in the shoebox and they can't see above them. They can't see to the left or the right. They can't see below. They just see that one little tiny square or rectangle. But then when they open up and then all the walls 
fall away. They can do a 360 degree view and see, oh my gosh, the color, the light, the beauty, the power, the love. And a lot of the time, once they get over that ego mind of, oh, I'm going to be different and all these things and, and the wounds and then the, the healing that they need to do, once they get past that, they don't look back. So it's that process and it takes time. I wish one session would be enough <laughs> to catapult <laughs> you forward. And it can be, but you really need to do the work because a lot of stuff comes up from the past and in this life, in past lives, concurrent bleed through lives, et cetera, et cetera, different timelines. All of that really is important. So it's about understanding it's a process, it's a journey and being open to what's going to happen and what's there. From what I know about you and what I've gleaned from our conversations is that you are a proponent of empowering self-healing because one of your core principles that I see, and correct me if I'm wrong, in your practice is empowering individuals to become their, their own best guide, their own healer. And mm -hmm. this approach shifts the traditional dynamic between mm -hmm. healer and patient, if you will, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. encourages a more active role in one's healing mm -hmm. journey. One of the precursors to empowerment is awareness. Can you elaborate more on your philosophy of empowering clients to be their own healers? I agree. That's exactly one of the main differences from the past world of healer and client and patient, because the healer would do all the work and the client would be the recipient and receive, which was wonderful. But if you don't do the, your own actual work in your self-healing, and you don't really look at the deep things of that repetitive thought process, for example, the negative thoughts you're telling yourself and the negative patterns you're thinking, and you don't do that work, no matter what any healer does, it's just gonna draw all that back to take ownership. And it is work. I have no other word to describe it. I wish I did, <laughs> but you have to do the work and you have to honor, and it's okay. There are gonna be hard moments. There are gonna be easy moments and they're just gonna be moments. And whatever it is to acknowledge and know that, okay, I'm in this moment and I have to address this lesson that I'm supposed to learn. I've learned it, okay, and let's move forward. But it really is important to do that work because it makes you feel you are a participant, but you have the power because all of us can work on self-healing. You don't necessarily need the guide, but the guide is helpful because then they can help steer you and help it go along a lot faster. I've had a lot of clients with self-love. That's a big one that a lot of us contend with. In order for us to offer unconditional love out into the world, we have to first love ourselves. And I find that no matter how much healing someone gives you, if you still have negative self-talk, it won't help you love yourself. So that it's so important. And I give my clients homework. <laughs> they say, okay, what's my homework today? Because you have to do that. Yeah. I agree. You have to do the work and not only the work of it, you have to embody and embrace mm -hmm. an ecology mm -hmm. of practices. Mm -hmm. Then you can enact and extend it, not mm -hmm. just to others, but as a vibration, as a resonance. Yes. So you establish an ever ready media between you and mm -hmm. those things that will come to help you heal. Mm -hmm. Somebody might go, those things that come help you heal. What are you talking about? Are you talking about angelic structures? Yeah, I am. Because mm -hmm. those exist. It's important to allow that to be in mainstream and not label it as the who anymore because it really is, there's evidence now, right? There's scientific evidence of some of these esoteric, huge things theories out there that are not theories that, that some of us are experiencing, but now it's coming out into the mainstream. It's important to remind everyone that it's not this foreign world anymore. Everyone has this ability to connect to source and spirit and, and talk to their spirit guides and communicate with the angels and do the self-healing and all of that. So yeah, I agree. Do you love your husband? I do. Show me. I can't show you. <laughs> so wait, so tell me why you're saying that. I'm saying that because it's difficult to show that to me in a physical right. way. My point is it's unseen. Yeah. If you jump off mm -hmm. the Eiffel Tower, you will die. 
<laughs> That's right? Gravity, you can't yeah. see it, but it's there. It's like the wind. Yeah. You can't see it, but you can certainly feel it. We talk about angelic structures and we talk about guides mm -hmm. and we talk about these things that want to attend the human to help upgrade and elevation. We can't mm -hmm. necessarily see them because our focus is on the material, mm. on the physical. It's so limited, even so within, within our yes. spectrum. We've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our spectrum. But what's beyond that spectrum? And you're right. It's about the belief. And not just the belief, but the knowing. And I know a lot of people, myself included in the beginning, my mind wanted to understand a lot of it. I struggled to understand the why. And I had so many questions. Okay, well, why is that like that? And how does that work? And what is the difference? And all of those really important questions in the moment, but in reality, our minds may not understand it fully. So it's easier to let go of the questions and accept and know that it's bigger than our minds can handle. Because if we were able to understand it, our minds would blow up, right? It's just so much, we can't handle it cognitively and consciously. But to understand that, yes, as you continue to process and work in this realm of this big angelic source realm, you'll just get that knowing. And some people, it can be like this. And then some people, it's hard to turn off the left side of the brain. What, what people don't well. realize is you have an auric field and an auric cortex, the external part of your aura, contains all your information. What, what do kids do at school? They do this, don't they? They put their hands up. Why do they put right. their hands up? What, what, what is the significance of it? Maybe they're plugging in to the auric cortex where all the information is stored. Sometimes you mm. want to make a decision. What do people say? They say, I'll sleep on it. Go into the That's... astral realm. They get their downloads. They go off and they travel into the other realms to get more information. And then they come back. Yeah. And it, it's transrational. What do I mean by transrational? What I mean by that is that there is rationality in it, but there is also things they don't necessarily understand. I remember working with a CEO some time ago, and, and this is where it all stemmed from when he said, I've got to sleep on it. And I said, what happened in the morning? He said, I woke up and it was like, I've got it. The decision is made. Did you sit down and analyze it all? And perhaps there was right. some of that, but then he right. let that go. He gave it over to his chief how officer. And yeah. he, he wakes up with the decision that he needed to make. When I teach clients, I actually have a YouTube video on this where you can actually ask your higher self and you can get those answers. So you don't necessarily have to wait till you sleep per se, if it's a big one when you really want to get the right answer, but you could even do it in your daily existence, just asking your higher self and then feeling the answers and saying, okay, if you have a moment, if you have to make a decision right then and there, but yeah. This is where your inner tuition comes in. Right. Your inner guidance, your, your higher inner guidance, self. Yeah, exactly, yeah. because we all have that. If we can build that, establish an, an inner stability and an outer equilibrium, the synthesis right. of those two things have a compatibility of alignment with the generic patterns of the universe. In mm. other words, have you ever tried to run water uphill? Yes, exactly. It doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless you've got yeah. some kind of machine or whatever it is to yeah. pump it uphill. But water right, yeah. naturally flows mm -hmm. in a particular direction. It's not uphill. So right. If you go against the patternings mm -hmm. of natural law and universal law, mm. and you don't understand what the ethical, human, material, and universal views are, then you become subject to being ignorant about it. And ignorance is bliss, mm -hmm. but it's also fatal. And you end up missing out a lot on life. And I don't want to have judgment on anyone that doesn't understand it, because when you really look at it from an outside view, all of this that we're talking about, it sounds like the Matrix in a way, you know, that movie, right? Mm -hmm. it, it blows people's minds when they really step outside and see, oh my gosh, you know, a fragment of your soul comes down to live on this earthly realm and you experience all this. And then when you cross over and you pass away or you die and you cross over to the other side, you're really going back to the origin of it all. It can sound very Hollywoodish, right? It is mind blowing. 
It is, but it's so exciting. And when you get that awareness, you live so differently. So I, I hope for those that are waking up or that are realizing something bigger than themselves, that's why we're here. It's not to get up and do that robotic, mundane existence, but to live in the glory of taking a sip of water and really reveling in that fact or going outside and seeing the trees or the Everglades or the pine trees, putting your hand on them or standing barefoot outside. Whenever I'm really disconnected, I go outside, even in the winter, and it's a unique experience to stand barefoot in snow. I can't do it for very long, but it's so invigorating and so powerful. And it drops me back into why I'm here and being on this earth. And it just revitalizes me. We all can experience life like that, that rejuvenated every step we take. Oh my gosh. It's like your NDE, your near-death experience. You're given a totally different perspective of life and things in a totally different way. Now, I haven't had that experience, but I can feel what your experience is and I can understand it on a totally different level where sometimes my mind will say, How do you? I don't even know that, but yet I can feel that, that knowing. And getting back to the original point, how we started is that you don't want to have that experience. It would be so beautiful if you don't have to, but some of us need that jolt and, and so we need that experience to help us be really here and have that new shift of perspective. One of the things that I, I learned, and this came months afterwards, but I recognized in that place, if it's a place or in that dimension, there's no time. Everything is instant. Everything felt mm. in a nanosecond. It just happened in my mind. What I recognize is here on earth in this mortal coil is that we are here in slow down time to experience mm. the agony and the ecstasy, to experience mm. the pain and the pleasure, if you like. Mm -hmm. Because through those experiences, we can start to ascend. Whereas in that space, it was totally different. And the reason I'm saying that is because the messages I got when I was there came into my mind so quickly. It wasn't somebody speaking to me. It was just immediate. Mm. It made me think about how there didn't seem to be any time there, but here time seemed to be slowed way down so that we can experience the good and the bad, the tall and the short, the mm -hmm. rain and the sunshine, all mm -hmm. those things and the way we interact with each other. And when we do cross over, this stuff does mm -hmm. not get processed. It rots, but this stuff, this auric cortex, mm -hmm. your credit card, you swipe it. It's yeah. that bar in the middle. You swipe it and it goes approved. And hopefully not declined. <laughs> I don't think anybody has declined as such, but as an analogy, that is what gets processed is what's in here, not what's mm -hmm. in here. So we can dress the body up. We can adorn it with jewelry. Mm -hmm. We can have facial reconstruction and cosmetic surgery, mm -hmm. all these things, but that will rot. We will die. It's unknown, but it's certain. So what do we do with our time on this earth? What is our mission whilst we're here? And I'm not saying it's for everybody because mm -hmm. you go into the rough and tumble of spirituality yeah, and it's tough. It can be, but it also can be very life-changing. I find that people with similar situations like you who had the NDE, now I, I don't know anything about your life prior to that, but people that have had those experiences or those spiritual awakening moments of a crisis that occurred and then all of a sudden they see the world differently and they've had that moment of, okay, I have to live in a different way. What I'm doing is not the way I've got to live. Whatever that culmination, that experience that has brought them to that revelation, they then perceive it in a different way and, and, and they make a choice. Is this existence going to be hard or am I going to be open to just knowing that again, all that's going to come in as part of this path? Like you said, the good and the bad, the rain and the sun. So it's about that mental headspace, if you will, and then that heart space and then joining them to know, okay, whatever is to come. And I meant to have all that happen. And then I live it. And it can be difficult if you 
want it to be difficult, right? If you make it difficult, it's all about a shift in perspective and a change. Your physical outside world is a reflection of what you're thinking. So if you are constantly running those lower vibration thought processes and those negative thoughts or I'm not good enough, I'm this, I'm that, this always happens to me, blah, 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 then you're going to see that in your outside world. But if you just shift and say, okay, but I am a good person. I am lovable. I love myself. And you remind yourself of that, it shifts your reality. So it's that vibration. So the law of attraction, the universe's vibration feels what you're putting out there subliminally and cognitively. It's your choice of how you perceive it to be. And like you were talking about your surgery to come up and there's no negative underlying emotion. You're just saying, I have to get it done. And when it happens and it's a very neutral existence, it can be frustrating, of course, because you're like, hey, Got to get this going, right? This is my health. This is my physical vehicle in this life. But when you have that neutral feeling, that calmness of knowing that it's going to come in the right divine time and it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be exactly how it's going to be, then you release the, the worry and the fear and all those lower vibration emotions that associate it with the dis-ease, right, of that. And then you just know. And there's that, again, that knowing. And it takes practice. It takes a lot of strength to really put your positive footstep forward or those thought process forward and not let the mind come in and, and drag you down. It really is to say, okay, mind, I, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for always protecting me in those moments in the past, but I don't need you right now. I have a stronger sense of where I am. My consciousness is going to lead the way. I'm going to buckle you up in the backseat. I'm going to put you back there. <laughs> You're in the fifth row in the bus. It's just about making that choice. This is one of the greatest gifts we're given. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about your NDE if it's possible. Okay. January 7th, 2023, I was experiencing Rigor. I was mm -hmm. a lot of shivering. My wife has been a nurse for 35 years. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Now she's a director of clinical care at a hospice. She was with me at the time and she looked at me and she said, I need to see your urine. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? She took one look at it and she called the GP. I went to see the GP and he took one look at me, he calls the registrar and they whisked me off into hospital. That was a Friday night. And of course there was a massive traffic jam. I was vomiting out the window. I was in a bad way. And unbeknown mm. to me, I had sepsis. Thank God for the medical profession. People who mm. vilify the medical profession take note. They mm. are brilliant. They're absolutely fantastic in what they do. And I applaud what they do. Without going into all the details of it, 6.30 in the morning, the surgeon said the antibiotics mm. haven't worked. We're willing you into surgery straight away to do a, a bowel resection. Mm. Mm. We're going to get you into surgery now. I think it was about a five or six hour procedure. At some point during the surgery, it felt like I was on the ceiling. All I could see was this body with a huge cut down the center of my abdomen. And these guys all fiddling around in there. And I thought, that's happening to my body. I was detached from it. It didn't seem relevant or salient to me in any way. There was no emotion about it. And the next thing I found myself in this chamber, and mm. I don't know if they, they were people. I, I, they didn't seem like they had any gender. I couldn't say they were male or female. But they all had very long white hair and robes. And they mm. were spinning spheres of light that mm. had gold and silver and platinum they were like spinning it yeah yeah and i was thinking oh my gosh this is amazing at that point i thought have i crossed over have i died mm. i thought if i have this is great i feel so well i feel right. so good <laughs> i just want to stay here yeah and these words kept coming into my head it said not yet yeah. Not yet, not yet. You still have work to do. Those are the exact words. Yeah, yeah. I can sense that, yeah. The next thing I knew, there was a nurse leaning over me, trying to wake me up. I looked at her and she had rainbow shafts coming out of her eyes. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Almost like lasers coming out of her eyes. First thing I said to her, can you grab me a pen? And a sheet of paper, I need to write this down. 
because I just had an experience. And if it was a dream, I, d I don't want to forget it because I know that <laughs> you can lose fragments of it. She said, you don't need a piece of paper. I said to her, are you an angel? She smiled like, it's almost like she knew. Yeah. They took me into the recovery room and I was still seeing this chamber. And then it just right. dissipated. I was mm. delighted and surprised and invigorated, but also a little bit troubled by it because mm. I couldn't understand where I was. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It makes me wonder if you, there, there needs to be counseling for people who have NDEs because it was a time where I still felt in a different dimension, even though they were doing mm. all this stuff to me and they right. put me into a high dependency unit and monitoring me trying to tell anybody mm. about it was yeah. quite something people who have no understanding of different dimensions because the rational thing would be it's the drugs yeah, yeah. it's your brain yeah. if it was yeah. a dream we all know with dreams you wake up you remember parts of it then one minute later you only have fragments of it then the next moment it's gone right it wasn't like that for me it was a transcendent experience that gave birth to this podcast, Transcendent Minds. I felt I need to be able to have other people come into this podcast home mm. and talk about their experiences and find out what are people experiencing today on our planet and how can we have an open and engaged dialogue without judgment mm. so those voices can be heard, can be amplified. That was, in short, what happened. I had the vision of it the entire time, and it feels so real and right and exactly home. And, and so funny, because when you were telling me the message you got, what I heard was, it's not his time yet. It's not his mm. time yet. Right? And you were saying, not yet, not yet. And I was thinking, I wonder who they were. Where it could be, who knows, I'm speculating, right? Because I'm asking and they're just giving me a bunch of different versions of who it could have been. I can tell you when we're off recording, I can tell you what my perception is of it. There's so many stories of people that have such similar experiences mm -hmm. that are really powerful. And, and some of us, like myself, I have not had an NDE, but I can feel it and I can see it. And I traveled with you when you were describing the story because you were descriptive of all the little details. Despite it being such a short ex experience in this moment, it was so grandiose. And the fact that you were in that chamber and then the people with the robes and the white hair and the cylindrical i mean it looks like they were deciding whether or not you were going to stay or you're going to go or maybe they were just working on your health in that moment in time who knows i forgot to mention which was important and i know people have mentioned this before i felt radiant love not sexual love or intimate mm -hmm. love or it was something that seeped into my sinews mm -hmm. it was like gold and silver rain just mm -hmm coming in through my head mm -hmm. and washing through me. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking yeah. about it. But it, it, it was that feeling of, I have never experienced this before. When my family members, when my father crossed over, and since then we've had six more on my side cross over, and the first vision I was ever given, and that sense of them landing on the other side of the bank of the river, the vision I was given, and this feeling of, that unconditional love, this feeling of being at home where everything is just exactly right. When you're a child and you hug your parent and that comfort and love and that unconditional, no matter what that support, that just that feeling of security and peace and harmony and all of that all in one, amplified by a million plus infinity, that's what I feel when I see that realm. And when I feel that it's indescribable. It was pure. It was selfless. It right. was a selfless form of love mm -hmm. without expectations, without limitations. Right. It transcended personal desires and judgments. It was in the true sense, it was unconditional because there were no mm -hmm. expectations. And there was such an acceptance I accepted myself mm. without reservation. There mm. was this commitment to being in the presence, regardless of what the circumstances were. 
there was this expansive, inclusive form of love that mm. really extended beyond any kind of personal relationship I've ever felt. And right. I thought, wow, this fosters such a deep healing and growth in myself. Mm -hmm. it, it creates this stronger and authentic relationship with my yeah. body and my mind yeah. and the compassion and empathy started to be promoted within me what uh, could reach a much broader scale the manifestation of it was this feeling was a deep acceptance of, of self mm -hmm. yeah the, the actions that i would then take would be without any expectation of return it's like selfless just to give and the consistent care and compassion I can see on a physical level, there, there is a challenge of self-love because many people find it easier to love others unconditionally than to extend the same love to themselves. What's amazing is you can have that feeling when you realize that here on this earthly realm, you do have that love and support from the angels, from source, from the Akashic Lords. Everyone can tap into the Akashic records, right? The energy, if you're still your mind and you open up your being and you really feel it, but that love, that unconditional love, that support, all of us can tap into it. Most important thing though, is if you want to feel it, you have to ask to say, if you need help or want that feeling, you have to say angels, archangels, spirit guides. Kaushik masters, the source energy, universe, whatever you want to call it, God, divine, please help me. And then they help, right? Because this is a free will realm. So you have to ask, they can't intervene. You can experience that type of unconditional love and support. You just have to ask. And I think when people have those moments, those crisis moments or those spiritual awakening moments, some of them do express and say, God, help me in this moment or universe, I need help or God, please, or whatever they say in that moment, God comes and swoops them in, source comes in, mm. the universe comes in. It's there for all of us. One of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, and thank you for allowing me to share the NDE with you. Thank you for sharing. You're most welcome. I can still remember it so vividly. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about the ascension process because... Okay, so the arguments for it, what I see in it, is that there are widespread spiritual experiences and shifts in consciousness, and it can mm -hmm. explain and also offers hope and, and purpose in a, in, a, in a chaotic world. There's mm -hmm. also the encouragement of personal growth and self-improvement, and it aligns mm -hmm. with many spiritual and in, indigenous traditions. Now, the people who go, devil's advocate might say, well, there's no clear scientific evidence or empirical support for that. And you're just full of imaginal thinking and attachment from reality. And uh, that could potentially delay you seeking psychological help. What you're really talking about is a vague and unfalsifiable predictions. That's what you're involved in. I can sit with both of those. In terms of exploring this a little bit further, I see it as a concept in spiritual and metaphysical circles that really describes a collective shift in human consciousness and energy. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a transformative journey. That's what I felt with the NDE. And I'm not saying everybody has to go have an NDE to have the right. same process, right? But it, this journey that individuals and humanity as a whole we're undergoing that now, which will lead mm -hmm. to higher states of awareness and vibration and spiritual mm -hmm. evolution. In your own mind, what is the ascension process? Is it a gradual awakening of human consciousness to higher dimensional realities? The ascension process long time ago was like the hero's journey, right? At that long process of someone having this moment, the crisis moment or NDE or something saying, I need to change, I need to shift. And then going out into the Eastern part of the world and living and secluding themselves and ridding themselves of materialism and all the things that were considered bad influences per se or whatever it was. That was so long ago. 
But in this moment in time, the spiritual awakening process, the ascension process, it starts with that shift in your perspective. And then it's been amplified because the vibration of the earth has really risen so much and is continuing to rise. The collective consciousness of the world is changing and shifting in our current day. And every day, every month, we all are shifting and changing. My gosh, every month, I am a different person, right? I'm shifting, I'm changing, I'm healing, I'm growing. All of us are. Even some of us that don't even realize it. Things are coming up for us to help us. And I don't really know much about astrology, and that is on my list to learn more about. But with all the astrological changes with the planets and their positions, it's bringing up a lot of things, these wounds, these issues, these lessons that we are to address, even if you don't realize it, it's coming up for you for a reason. So you can clear, you can heal, you release, you let go. So then you can go on into raising your vibration. It's an amplification right now for everyone and it is quicker. And I think that process starts with the, it's got to be bigger than me just be being here, right? There's got to be so much more in this world than that than living this robotic, mundane, benign existence. Once you have that shift, however fast or slow that person can handle and wants to address it, and again, in the spiritual waking process, sometimes people have that moment, but then they go back to old patterns, right? Because they're not ready, and that's okay too. So it's a very individual journey, but once you step forward on it and you say, okay, I'm here, and I'm going to do this. And you let your walls fall down of your diorama, right? Of your perception of what the world is. Then the colors become vibrant and then the opportunities are all right there. You determine and decide how fast or slow you want. But once you do wake up to that moment, it can be very fast because the vibration right now is very high. It's higher. The 3D realm is really leaving and we're going into 4D, 5D, et cetera. It's really opening up and it's going to take time for the whole earth to get there, but it's starting. The crash hasn't happened yet. You know, the big wave coming down, but it's, you know, we're at the crest. I was speaking to somebody the other day and they said, I'm really experiencing very unusual physical symptoms. And I, I said, well, what are these symptoms you're experiencing? And they said, oh, they're ascension symptoms. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, I'm feeling psychologically lethargic. Mm -hmm. I've got body aches. I've got changes in sleeping patterns. I feel like I don't need to eat as much. I've got more of a heightened sensitivity to foods and environments and people. I thought, well, okay, I've never heard ascension symptoms before. In your experience working with clients, have you come across clients who've had these physical symptoms associated with the ascension process? When you are changing your vibration, sometimes the body needs to purge. So it can come in different forms. It could come in a flu-like form, or it can come in body aches or leth lethargy, that fatigue because your body rest is where we heal and we grow when you sleep, or it could come in on the other end in different ways when you're clearing out your system. Sometimes it could just be a cold, right? But if you're in the active conscientiousness of shifting and changing your vibration, yes, I have seen clients experience it. I myself ex have experienced it as we grow, our bodies need to get rid of it. Our physical bodies need to get rid of some of this stuff. And it can be a lot. Sometimes it can slow you down and force you to rest and integrate. Sometimes the energies can be so powerful and the vibration so strong that our bodies really can't keep up with it. So we need that downtime to rest for a couple of days and to get rid of what we need to get rid of the old so the new has space to come in. How do you help people differentiate between ascension symptoms and potential health issues that may require medical attention? I mean, that's a great question. I think it depends on if they are in that process, if they have had that lesson or they're working through lessons or they're healing, et cetera. So I think it really is a very individual awareness and then to ask the angels, I like go into their records and really determine. But of course, yes, if there's some really big pain you're having, yeah, go to the doctor, go to urgent care, of course, yes. Yeah. But I think a lot of it won't be that systemic. It'll just be something like a cold or a flu or something. It has to be very individualized and you really do have to differentiate it in the moment. And sometimes you might not know till after the fact. Another hallmark of in my research and also 
I've been feeling that myself is there's an awakening of one's intuition and the hallmark of the ascension process seems to be the awakening or enhancement of intuitive and psychic abilities. You may start experiencing heightened empathy or clearer inner guidance. If you've come across clients who are in this process, how do you help them navigate the awakening of their intuitive abilities? Are there any practices or techniques that you found most effective in helping people trust and develop these emerging skills? Oh, yeah. I teach clients how to listen and how to learn how to hear their inner guidance, either hear clairaudience wise or feel when they're asking a question so they can tap into their own inner self or their higher guidance. Also in the process, helping them to clear and heal anything that comes up in the way of their ascension. It could be a lesson to learn. It could be a trauma, a block. It could be a wound that comes up that's preventing them from getting to the next step. It's all very individual. And then also teaching them to really trust and believe in themselves and believe in what's happening and trust and know that what they're sensing, what they're feeling is there. Because a lot of people question it and, and then the mind comes and says, oh no, that's not what's happening. So if you really are working on your intuition to really trust and have that belief and that knowing, then that augments it even more because it's very easy to, if you're teetering on that line of, is this really happening? Is this not? Is this me making it up? Is it not? It's, you can defer back to old thought patterns. So it's just to help them to have that confidence in themselves and to clear whatever's any obstacles in the way. I've been on patterns and looking at patternings. One of the patterns that I've noticed through the ascension process is many people report this urge to live more authentically and mm. align with their true purpose. What I've found is many people enact a significant life change and that, that might manifest as a career change or mm -hmm. they shift in their relationship or they transform their relationship or their certain mm -hmm. life lifestyle adjustments. In your work, how do you help people balance this inner calling with practical life considerations? A really great question. Everything is a choice. So if they are in a situation, in a relationship where they are feeling that for, this is an example, that they should shift and change it in the relationship in that self. And then they do the work first for themselves and then working on the relationship together and actively working on that. And then going forward and deciding, do we stay together? Do we not? helping them have the confidence in first looking at what they need to work on, what they need to heal, and then looking at the bigger picture. It's so individualized. It all comes back to trusting within yourself and knowing you can't control anybody else. You can only control your own actions, your own thoughts, and you can't heal anybody else. You can't tell anybody else, listen, you've got issues with A, B, C, D, E, and F. Go get some help, right? But you can register and know, I have to work on what I need to work on. And then working on it, healing it, so you make a more informed, better decision that's not really ego-based or emotion-based, but really heartfelt-based. Part of that pattern recognition is in the domain of synchronicities, because I also mm -hmm. see many people experience this process. They report this increase in meaningful coincidences mm -hmm. or synchronicities in their lives. And and these experiences can often feel like confirmation of their spiritual path mm -hmm. of guidance mm -hmm. from a higher source. How do you teach your clients to recognize and interpret these experiences without becoming overly dependent on external signs? The signs from the angels, from the universe are just to confirm to you, to remind you to say, hey, look, you can ping someone, for example. So in the world right now in the universe, if you're thinking about someone, all of us have this ability and you're thinking, I'm thinking of Johnny Joe and I just am thinking about them and, and I just want to send them some love. And then all of a sudden you look at your cell phone and Johnny Joe's calling you. We all have that ability. 
we all have this intuition. We all have this sense that we can tap into this universe, knowing that the universe is giving you signs. The angels are giving you these signs to remind you that you are on the right path. And that is exactly right. When you have like those moments when you're pinging someone, it's just to remind you, you have that ability. It is really when the synchronicities start to happen and that shows to you that you are living authentically. You really are living day in and day out in that present moment and being very conscious and you can manifest anything, right? It's this mindset of knowing, okay, I'm going to manifest this one experience or item or whatever it is. I'm going to believe in it. I'm going to know this is going to happen. I'm going to make my vision boards. I'm going to envision myself with it. Then I'm going to trust. And not just trust here, but trust in your heart and just have that knowledge of knowing, oh my gosh, yes. Then it comes to fruition. It does. My favorite manifestation story is I manifested curry powder in Costco here <laughs> back literally in the aisle looking up and down and having this sense and then I turned and there it was, one sole bottle of curry powder. And I remember when I went to the cashier, she said, oh my gosh, we don't even have this in the register. We gotta go look in the analogs to find it because they didn't even have the correlation in their own books. And I thought, how cool was that? So when you believe and you have that faith and that trust and you make the vision and you are in that moment, you can manifest anything like that. With trust and the integration of those expanded perceptions into your everyday life. What challenges may arise when a person's worldview begins to differ significantly from those around them? And how do you guide them through this? Number one, I think the most important thing to do daily is to protect your energetic field or augment it with love. I have a spiritual awakening kit where I have a meditation where people can listen to do that on a daily basis, because that's important. As you mentioned before, our auric fields are huge. They're about eight feet from our physical bodies. So it's really important to fortify yourself on a daily existence to help you not take on other people's energies to not take on other people's thought processes and their emotions and to really stay steadfast in who you are and, and where you are. And then making sure in your mind's eye that you are completely closed up in your golden ball of light. There's a Hawaiian prayer that you can say when someone has a different view than you. And if you're starting to find yourself having any type of judgment towards them, for example, that's really just a reflection of what's happening inside you. Maybe there's an insecurity. Maybe there's something you're wondering, am I really speaking the truth? I'm wondering if what I'm saying is really accurate. So you could do that Ho'oponopono prayer and you can put that energy out there, which is really simple. It's a four phrases. It's, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me and thank you. And you're saying that to say, I love you to your own true divine self. Say, I'm sorry for having that lower vibration, that negative thought or that belief. Please forgive me. And thank you for helping me to transmute that lower vibration, that energy. And you are going to experience things or people or the world because right now there's so much chaos happening in the world. And it's to remember that's the ebb and flow of life, right? And unfortunately, sometimes there has to be the destruction of something to have the new earth to rebuild. Right. And the way it's come about is sad and it's hard and it's tough. The world is really a different place than 20, 30 years ago. But it's to help us to really fortify and stay here, continue to be conscious, continue to raise our vibrations so that when people are around you, by having a higher vibration, you can help them raise their own vibrations. Right? We can't change anyone else, but we can help ourselves to augment and, and lift ourselves up and send love to those people may or may not be acting the way that we would hope that they would act and sending that unconditional love and protecting this earth and imagining the earth mama gaia and in her glory and then putting a golden ball of light around her and sending love to her in all the places in the world there's so much we as individuals can do 
And yes, the collective consciousness, when we all do it together, it's so amplified and it's so powerful. But we too individually have that power. So it's to remind us of our power and to not let anything outside lower your own vibration. Powerful message. Very powerful. God, there's so much more I want, I want to talk to you about, but I'm obviously respectful of time. Would you like to come back at some point? Oh my gosh, that would be an honor. I don't want to talk to you about in terms of the work that you're doing and mm. how those tendrils expand into consciousness mm. and how that manifests itself and looking at unconditional love and the ascension process and spiritual mm. awakening. Where can people find you and do you have any parting words? They can find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, Spiritual Awakening to Heal. And if you plug in my name along with it, you might find me faster. Rainu Maida Chang. I have a website which is being worked on as we speak. So whenever this goes live, hopefully it's up and running. But if not, it's in the process. SpiritualAwakeningToHeal.com. I have a free gift, a spiritual awakening kit with tools and tips and meditations to help you on your spiritual awakening path and words to depart. This journey that we're given, this daily existence is truly an honor and a blessing. And it's not about having the heaviness of that. That can sound very big and a lot for some people to comprehend, but just to know that every day of this life, every second, every moment, you can really live fully and freely with unconditional love, peace and harmony within yourself. It just takes a thought, it just takes a shift to say, I'm gonna do it. And you can, we all can. It's about finding what brings you peace and love and joy, and then reveling in it, and then bringing that along with you as best you can every day. So well said, beautiful message. And how have you experienced the conversation today? It was wonderful. It was so wonderful. It was natural. It was organic. It was so enlightening. You're such a knowledgeable person. I really learned so much. And your NDE story was so incredible. And of course, individual to you, but just really powerful. I'm really glad you shared it. So thank you. Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And I see this as a pause continuance. And I really look forward to having you back again. Thank you, Rainy, so much. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. And I'm so happy you're on the mend. And good luck with the next surgery. Thank you. 